I want to thank Norm, my friend in the diplomatic community, for his leadership here at Brookings. Thank you very much uh, for putting this together. Nick Penniman, uh, the director of Issue One, where I work, uh, Mike Peabody on our board, and other board members and our chair. Uh, I also uh, want to thank the guests and the people in the room for attending, for tweeting, for talking to people uh, about the problem and the solutions that we will articulate here today. While we are in a crisis, there are certainly many, many answers that bipartisan groups of uh, people can work on to bring back our government. I have to start with a quote to be bipartisan from Abraham Lincoln, who really put into, I think, great context what we face today. He said, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter, if we fail, it will be because we destroyed ourselves, unquote. And we, ladies and gentlemen, are engaged in this suicidal process of destroying ourselves. Whether you're a Democrat and you care about climate change or a Republican and you want to work on protecting the Second Amendment, whether you care about our kids in Flint, Michigan, or you want to work on a balanced budget, none of these problems can be adequately solved unless we look at the crux of the very problem infecting Washington, and that is what this panel is going to talk about money in the system that demands too much of their time, too much of their resources, and corrodes and corrupts the overall trust of the American people in this system. As many of you do, I was speaking uh, with young people not too long ago at a college campus, and one of them said to me, Tim, have you ever seen our politics so upside down before? Who's going to win the presidential race. What do you predict, Tim? And then somebody said and raised their hand, Tim, what do you think about these two tickets? Trump, Palin, Sanders, Warren. That's the kind of volatility that we see in our politics today. We don't know who the two nominees are going to be. And I would say very directly to everybody in this room and across the country, some of the outsiders are connecting to the American people right now with their messages, not only on the economic dislocation and the inequality in our country, they are directly connecting to the American people on the political dislocation and lack of trust of the American people in the system. Too many people believe donors have more influence than voters. Too many people are starting to say, when they think about running for Congress, money is determining not only who wins our elections, it's determining who even decides to run in our elections and winnows out good people before they even get involved in our great democracy, especially so many of our young people that are now considering getting involved in politics and they say, Tim, Steve, Tim Worth, Connie Morella, how do I do this if I don't know a millionaire who can fund my campaign? As an ambassador, and I know Norm can speak to this, as you travel around the world, you hear other people talk about America. And oftentimes it is, I want to go to America because it is the greatest place in the world to live and pursue your dreams. But we're starting to hear people say now more and more as you travel around the world, what happened to America? Now other countries are starting to know that you have a pay-to-play system, and they're starting to work your system internationally. They're paying and playing in American politics. That's not how our system is devised, ladies and gentlemen. On the sixth anniversary of Citizens United, as Washington is divided and dysfunctional, the American people are pretty united across the board. 
70 and 80 percent of the American people, Republicans and Democrats, are all saying, we want to fix our political system. Go to Washington and fix it. We've got a great panel, people who have worked in Washington, D.C., and who either represent our Reformers Caucus, 116 former Democrats and Republican members of the House and the Senate and governors and secretaries of cabinet positions, but we also have a current member of Congress who, uh, Steve, I don't want to question how smart you are right now, but anybody who can be talked into coming from New York to Washington on his week off in the middle of a snowstorm either is really dedicated to fixing our politics or loves the snow. And as a fellow Midwesterner, I love the snow. I can't wait for the blizzard coming over the weekend. I can't wait. Washington might finally get a real snowstorm. So as we get into their stories, I want to introduce the panel and then introduce our uh, distinguished interveners. First of all, uh, I want to say, Steve, a friend of mine, Steve Israel, Congressman Israel, thank you so much for joining us and coming down from New York. Uh, when Congress is out of session, uh, your distinguished service uh, both to country and to uh, your state, uh, I think everybody recognizes the stellar and superb service. My friend Connie Morella, a Republican from the state of Maryland, who so many of us worked for in a work with in a bipartisan way when we served together, and she was a doer and somebody of action. And my good friend from Colorado, uh, Senator Tim Wirth, who long ago recognized uh, the challenges in the world of climate change and uh, started uh, uh, the clarion call uh, a couple decades ago on this important issue. So we'll get to them. Uh, let me first of all call on Jeff Peck, the principal of Peck, Madigan, and Jones, for a very quick uh, intervention. Sure. Thanks, Tim, and a pleasure you to be here. Stand up. Do you want to come up here? What, what's easiest for you? Probably take you 30 seconds to get up I, here, I and know, that's so off I your better, time. I, only, I have a limited amount all of right. time. I, I won't spend any of it walking. Um, so I have three, uh, just three very, very quick points. Uh, number one, we've all talked about Citizens United. I think it's important to remind ourselves of one line in that decision uh, from Justice Kennedy, and I'm quoting here, we now conclude that independent expenditures, including those made by corporations, do not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption. So uh, I think just by the reaction uh, here and the reaction to anyone with a functioning brain around the country, uh, you would see now, uh, I think it was probably apparent then, but it's woefully apparent now how wrong that statement is. I want to focus uh, for a second on the appearance of corruption. And one thing we've talked about a lot is gridlock in Congress, but there's something deeper than that, and that is this, uh, you know, the cynicism and anger that so many Americans feel and feel their view that the government, the system, is not on the level and is rigged against them. And that contributes to the gridlock we see in Congress, but it's an underlying fault, fundamental problem. It's what Tim uh, talked about in terms of uh, failures and problems from within, and that is something we really, really need to, uh, to, to recognize. Second, uh, when it comes to presidential uh, campaigns, I think we really, it's not really corporations. We ought to focus on a specific problem when it comes to presidential campaigns, and that is contributions from individuals. You may have seen a New York Times story last summer talking about 158 families essentially funding half uh, the, uh, the presidential campaigns writ large. That is a stunning number uh, in terms of a small number of individuals, and they're Democrats and Republicans, although they lean tend to lean Republican who are really electing the president, uh, the, the next president. One example just to mention, and, and I'd encourage you all to look at a Bloomberg story yesterday about Robert Mercer and his funding of the Ted Cruz campaign. This is a gentleman uh, who's been very, very successful, has contributed $11 million so far to the Cruz campaign. That's part of the $38 million that Ted Cruz raised from a from the super PAC uh, for his campaign. So even if Ted Cruz had no popularity at all, and one of the reasons you see so many people in the races is because they have a super PAC 
uh, behind them. And it's not because, you know, the super PACs don't guarantee success. Uh, Rick Perry learned that. Jeb Bush is learning that. Sheldon Adelson and Newt Gingrich learned that last summer. But it's the appearance of corruption that that creates. Lastly, um, I think there's hope uh, and reason for optimism. I think, you know, as a result of Citizens United, citizens are united. Uh, and if you look at a recent poll, you see rare unity among Americans. 84% saying that money has too much influence, 66% saying that the wealthy have more influence. And the real reason for hope is 39% think fundamental change is needed, and 46% thinks this, think the system needs to be completely rebuilt. And in an era of cynicism and anger towards government, I take comfort in that higher percentage of people who believe we really need to fundamentally reform the system. Thank you very much. Chuck Marin. Uh, Chuck's uh, Executive Vice President with Prime Policy Group. Chuck, you've got a quick uh, two, two and a half, three minutes. Take it away. Um, what Tim hasn't made plain is that Jeff and I are lobbyists, so we left our Scarlet L's at the door, but we are active participants, practitioners in the substance of the issue at hand. I'm going to read a brief statement and ask a question. Um, I firmly believe that the financial arms race created by current federal election laws is a major underlying underlying cause of rising public cynicism about a system that seems rigged against everyday Americans, which in turn damages the public's already shaky confidence in the pursuit of the American dream, which is, in my mind, still the great differentiator between the citizens of this country and people around the world, the belief in the dream. Um, along with income stagnation and wage inequality, the chaos created by current campaign finance laws seems to validate for many voters that hard work and playing by the rules no longer makes their votes impactful to the legislative and political processes. Uh, a number of the other participants have referred to uh, the public polling numbers, the preferences of the majority of all Americans. Um, Donald Trump observed um, in the very first presidential debate last year, uh, speaking of his opponents on the stage, I'm paraphrasing here. He said, I gave all of them money for a reason. When the leading GOP candidate says that, he's clearly inferring that a successful businessman, as he is, he, he very consciously invested in elected officials to gain a strategic advantage in the marketplace. Growing public cynicism about the ability of very wealthy donors to game the system through super PACs and less than transparent disclosure regulations, in turn, ultimately corrodes the public's fundamental trust in government. Both, here's the irony. Both national political parties are consumed by this political arm, uh, fun, this fundraising arms race and the preservation of the status quo, which is ironic to me for two very significant reasons. The first, that this is directly contradicts the preference of most voters, and secondly, and more importantly, their intransigence around campaign finance reform is occurring at the very same time when the percentage of all Americans willing to self-identify as a member of either party is either declining, stagnant, or at record lows. So here then is my question for the group. When public disgust with the influence of money on the legislative process is palpable and growing, when the brand value of national political parties are hitting record lows, why don't national political party leader, leaders recognize that their support for thoughtful campaign finance reform can only enhance the standing of their increasingly unappealing national political party? All right, well, Chuck, great question. Connie, uh, I think we're going to go right to the panel and transition seamlessly to you to start, and maybe at the end of your three minutes you can start to uh, answer Chuck's good question. Whatever you want to do. Where are you? Where do you feel? I thank you. It was a nice introduction, and I, I do want to thank uh, the whole concept of Solutions Summit. When I see standing room here, I've got to uh, congratulate Brookings and Norm and Issue One that I'm involved in. And I want to thank, uh, you know, Mike and uh, Nick and, and Tim and all of the people who are here because we all realize that we do need a solution uh, to this money and campaign. Well, as you know, I'm Connie Morello and I approve this message. <laughs> And, you know, I was thinking with regard to my small time on this uh, panel that, you know, January is named for Janus. Janus was a, a god from Greek mythology that had two heads, looking back and then looking forward. And that's really what this Solution Summit is about. We look back at, at 
what should be, maybe where we saw some of that happening, and we look to the present where it isn't, and we look to the future where we have great hopes. Well, as I look back at my first my first uh, congressional uh, election in 1986, I was trying to remember how much I spent. It was about $300,000. That was a lot of money. That was a lot of money at that time. How did I raise it? I raised it by having fundraisers, having uh, meetings. I went to all my friends, all the organizations I belonged to, everybody who who was in, had any contact with me. They were afraid to see me for fear I was going to ask them for some money. But I'm talking about small amounts of money from the people that I wanted to represent. I wanted them to be part of my team. And that's what happened. Whether they wrote a check for $25 or $250, they all got a thank you note. And I had a commitment. I had a commitment that they were going to watch that election closely. Now, you also know, since some of you are my former constituents, that I have maybe the most highly competitive district, I think, in the country uh, with Democrats and Republicans. Now, that is, we should have more of those districts because they are motivators for you to do what you may want to do but might not be pushed to do, and that is to reach out, to reach out, to make sure that you have the Democrats who are listening to them, you are listening to the Republicans, and you are working out what you think the solution was that would benefit yourself, not yourself, would benefit your constituents, your conscience, and your country, probably in reverse order. Uh, subsequently, what happens now is the elect that same election would cost close to $2 million. And uh, the spigot never turns off. And whereas I had a connection with constituents, I'm not the only one that does, but had a connection with these constituents, when you're raising money from super PACs and from PACs, you just don't have that kind of, of um, uh, I guess, connection I keep using, of, of that simpatico. They don't really feel they trust you because they don't know you, um, and you just don't have that sense when you are involved with legislation. And so, uh, as Charlie Cook once said, who was a constituent, he said that Morella, she knows her district, she will go to the opening of an envelope. And truly, <laughs> and truly I did. And another problem is when you're raising all that money, from super PACs and from PACs, you don't know your own colleagues. That's another sense I have of the need for connection. If you respect people and know them, then you will listen to them, and even if you disagree, you're going to be respectful of that, and you're going to find some kind of a solution. And so I wish I had more time to talk about how OECD colleagues uh, from other countries looked upon the United States in terms of this outrageous money in campaigns, and they would talk to me about it and say, you know, what are you going to do in your country? It costs so much money, you know, for these campaigns. So we could take um, a leaf from, um, from their policy in terms of bringing about some changes. So this is a situation where um, we people, we pay for it, and we pay for it highly. as possible and get the questions right away. Let's go right to uh, Senator Tim Worth, and then we'll conclude with uh, Steve Worth. Make it as quick as possible here. My, my district is probably a mirror image of Connie's. There's a Democrat and a Republican district, but she was a Republican in a more Democratic district. What we had to do to get elected in an old world was very different from now. This is a panel about governance. And there are just a couple of other points I think that have to be made and, and uh, as part of this package. Uh, one of those relates to districting or redistricting, you know, which has become, which has changed so dramatically in the state of Colorado. It used to be redistricting was done by uh, a legislature and a governor together to spread uh, populations out. Now it was done in a very, very different way. The black community is all in one district. The Hispanic community is all in another district. And you lose completely the divert or a great deal, you lose the diversity that you need to get the job done that Connie was talking about, the outreach. But districting becomes a very important part of this whole puzzle. That can be solved. I think it's relatively simple to solve compared to the broader campaign finance issue. A second item, which Tom Daschle mentioned in his comments on the screen earlier, is scheduling in Washington. 
Tip O'Neill had a wonderful rule that we were three on and one off. You were in, in Washington for three weeks, you were gone, and you could do whatever you wanted in that other week. Go home, go, go to your district, do whatever you wanted to do. But we were expected to be here with votes on Monday and votes on Friday. We were here, which meant you got to know your colleagues, and you were forced to legislate. In fact, I suppose now you'd go and spend all your time in a booth dialing some money. But this at least forced everybody to be here, and that's a very important part of the governance issue. Uh, third part of this, which has been discussed, is disclosure. I hope we can come back to that. Um, let me use the rest of my time to talk about the impact of this on the substance of governance. I was involved deeply in two issues, telecommunications and energy climate. In telecommunications in the House, it was a group of members of Congress on both sides that helped to lead to the breakup of AT&T. Why was that important? Because we were moving from an analog to a digital world. It was extremely important, and AT&T didn't want to make that move. Similarly, we wanted to open up the lines that everybody paid for, the telephone lines, to be used by effectively cable providers and the Internet. The, the uh, telephone company resisted that, and the networks were furious at it. Now, why is that important for this discussion? Because I don't think that ever would have happened in the current environment. I think we would have been buried in money to say no, 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 no. And the, a lot of people were taking big chances to make the votes and make the pressure to defy AT&T and defy the networks. Uh, they could not do that now. I greatly admire what they did at that point. Was a, they were a very hard set of votes. Similar sort of phenomena exists now related to uh, uh, climate change. You all have watched that. And it, people, do they know any better? Well, I ask my, say myself, well, maybe they do know better, but maybe they don't. Maybe the fact is that the only people they talk to are people with a vast amount of money who have a huge amount of stake in this issue. They're not talking very broadly to other constituents or other people. And so they haven't learned the issue, and they don't know how complicated uh, an issue like climate is and how it demands a real attention to detail. Final point, which we have not talked about, which I de think demands a lot of discussion, is how the current gap between rich and poor is, in fact, reinforced by this access to the powerful by a few. Our country is governed not in a democratic way, but it's governed by a very few individuals who have access to the tax code, the regulatory code, a whole variety of privilege-building mechanisms that is making the gap between rich and poor in the country even worse. I hope we can come back to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. We have a great tradition in the House and the Senate that you could yield back time, which you don't do. And I want to compliment both Connie and Tim. Right on time. Tim, uh, the pressure's on you now. Same deal. Same deal, I promise. I want to, uh, I want to thank Ambassador Romer and uh, Senator Worth and Congresswoman Morella and my former Blue Dog colleague, Congressman John Tanner, uh, who was here, who was my mentor in the Blue Dog. I, I, I specifically invoke their titles because even though they're former officials, I'm about to be a former official. I'm told you get to keep the title as Congressman even after you leave. So this seems like a very good deal to me. Uh, I, uh, I'm a recovering member of Congress. And the best part of my recovery is I get to look at my schedule every day, and it is missing the two <laughs> worst words yeah. in Washington, D.C., call time, the process by which you dial for dollars. I no longer have to see call time on my schedule. It was a tantamount to picking up a schedule in the morning and seeing from one to three waterboarding. <laughs> because it was, for me, it, it became personal uh, torture. I, um, so I've been in New York. Several days ago, I visited a, a friend of mine and a very significant supporter of mine, John Katsimatidis, who happens to be a staunch Republican, ran for mayor of New York City, who's worth a considerable amount of money, had a nice conversation, ended the conversation, walked out, turned back, went back into his office, and I said, hey, John, I can't tell you how, what a delight it was for me to talk to you without asking you for money. And he looked at me and he said, Steve, I can't tell you what a delight it was to have you come and uh, not ask for money. Let me, uh, let me quantify this. I've been in Congress for uh, 16 years. Some of you read my op in the New York Times. 4,200 hours of call time. 1,600 fundraising events. $20 million raised just for my election in a competitive district. 
excluding the fundraising that I did as chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee uh, for four years. Sitting in a cubicle, as if you're selling penny stocks, only it's shares of democracy that are being traded. Right? And let me conclude with two points, respect for your time. One, easy point. For the record, I cannot think of one member of Congress on either side of the aisle who violates their principles for a pack check. I don't worry about that. I've never seen it happen. What I do worry about is the catastrophic opportunity cost. Every hour on call time is one hour less on policy. Every fundraiser is that much less time that you have sitting with somebody on the other side of the aisle talking about the sweet spot of compromise on infrastructure or gun safety or climate change, whatever it is. And finally, here's what I do worry about. I am in charge of messaging for the House Democratic Caucus until my term expires. I'm the chairman of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee, which means that I spend a lot of time with the focus group trying to figure out what's going on. The reason that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are doing so well is self-evident. There is a catastrophic loss of faith that most people have in institutions, particularly the institution of government. They saw an oil spill in 2010, government couldn't fix it. A hurricane in Louisiana. Uh, in 2004, government couldn't fix it. And now they believe, they witnessed a meltdown in the economy, government's not giving them the tools to stay ahead in a radically changing economy. And now they've come to the conclusion that the government is the problem. And in 2014, I'll just give you this statistic that quantifies it, in 2014, as the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, I witnessed this. One third of eligible voters went to the polls to support a Democrat or Republican. Two-thirds stayed home because they don't believe that they have a voice or a vote that matters because they don't have a pet chef or a lobbyist. And that is very dangerous for our democracy. Thank you all very much. If, uh, forgive the parallel, but if you saw the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, which happened to take place in my district, you saw these people, you know, sitting huddled in cubicles, selling stock, you know, and, and making that quick, that fast sell, right? That fast sell. Got to get them on the phone, no more than 15 seconds, make the sale, move on. Close the deal. Always be closing, right? That's kind of what it's like. You sit in a cubicle with an assistant. Some, some members, uh, you know, have the assistant will, and there's a notebook with, uh, a page about the donor that you're calling. It has the donor's name. It has the donor's address. It has the donor's spouse. And so I said, said in my New York Times op-ed, I once uh, found myself saying, how's Sheila? Oh, Shelly. How's Shelly? <laughs> um, the donor history. The history of donations. What other members of Congress they gave to? And so I was a blue dog. And if they gave to John Tanner, I would know they gave to John Tanner. And that was an affinity. It's an affinity call. And some of my colleagues do what's called double dialing and triple dialing. And so I'm talking to Tim Romer and asking him for the maximum uh, allowable under the law, while my assistant uh, has another donor on the phone crying so that I don't waste any time right. dialing when I could be talking and closing and closing. Uh, and uh, we're fueled by uh, junk food. Uh, and uh, I mean, I mastered the art. My, my finance What's assistant. <laughs> Well, I'm not gluten-free, so there's not a lot of ill. But actually, my, I, my finance assistant was actually convinced that I had a very serious medical problem because I mastered the art of saying that I needed to use the men's room like 15 times an hour to, to escape doing these calls. <laughs> like, you got to get your prostate checked, Congress. <laughs> uh, and, and so, and, and finally this, finally this. And this, I think, is, um, it illustrates my point about the, the opportunity cost. When votes are called and you're in the middle of call time, it becomes an impediment. Think about that. When votes are called and you're in the middle of call time, it becomes an impediment. I do not believe that our founders ever conceived of a system where 
anybody view votes as an inconvenience that was getting in the way of fundraising. It should be the other way around. It should be the other way around. Unfortunately, too much time is spent uh, on this, which is why we so desperately need reform that will not only level the playing field, but will create a, a life for members of Congress where they can focus on what matters back home uh, and uh, not this constant uh, uh, requirement uh, that they raise the money to defend themselves from a super PAC uh, attack in the, the, uh, the November. I wonder if, uh, can, and Sue, I wonder if you might want to comment on what the consequences are if you do not go over and make those calls, and also what happens with the kind of money that you are bringing in. Is that more possible? Well, I can, uh, I'll answer very briefly. When I chaired the DCCC uh, and uh, prospective recruits would sit with me and talk about, you know, what it's going to take, I would paint a, a, a tough picture for them. I would say, picture yourself in two years, it's October. Mm-hmm. You're sitting in your den, you're sitting in your house, you turn on the television, and you suddenly see uh, the most vile and despicable commercial against you, funded by a group you've never even heard of. Your only response at that point will be, did I make enough calls two years ago to raise the amount of money I'm going to need to defend myself? And that's where that opportunity cost is. So, I want to turn to Jim real quickly. Uh, we often hear that members of Congress want to get into politics, and sometimes pick people who want to get into politics, and sometimes hide them. Well, I knew exactly what it was in the last two years before a Senate campaign. We kept track, so we knew it was going to be bad. And I spent 85% of the time that I had, this was not time in committee hearings or on the floor, no official, outside of official Senate business, 85% of my time was spent raising money. And I was very good at it. I raised a lot of money for the campaign committee. I raised a lot of money for myself. I was determined after my first election I was not going to get outspent again. And, you know, that was just, you know, that was not going to happen. Defend yourself at all costs. And if you have that kind of a bankroll there, the other person, the other people are going to be less likely to go after you. But it's enormously debilitating. And it's not only that it's, uh, uh, takes a lot of time and you're sitting there and you're, you know, doing it over and over and over again, but it's really corroding of who you are. It's just incredibly corrosive to be there making that kind of request of people for money, you know, that you know, and a lot of them, why are they giving you money? Not because you're their best buddy in the world, because they want access. They want to make sure that they can get in the door the next time. Anybody who says that isn't true is lying. You know, people want access, and this is the way they get access. They're not getting access through town meetings. They're not getting access because of the money. They're getting access because of the money. And that is, a, that is also, you realize that, as I have always had that fact, very clearly in my mind. This is what this is all about, and I find it very, very corrosive. So let's turn to the audience. Uh, yes, right here in the purple... Here comes the microphone over from the side. Please tell us your name and quick question. Okay. Uh, I'm Eleanor Bachrock. In the 1970s, I worked in the Senate for Bill Proxmeyer, who famously did not take any campaign contributions and spent less than $1,000 on his re-election campaigns, which probably couldn't happen now. And I find it ironic that with this terrible redistricting problem that protects incumbents uh, to a large degree, we nonetheless have this spiraling cost of election campaigns. And um, 
I'd like to know some of the reasons. I think some of it is to try to prevent people from running against them, but it's it is a disgrace in every way I can conceive of, and I'm glad I was in the the golden age of the Senate, I guess. Connie, do you want to uh, yeah. answer? Uh, one of the things that I'm most concerned about, I teach a, a class periodically on women in politics, and a book has just come out, and that is Running from, uh, from Office or Running from Elections. And I'm concerned that the young people are really not looking to public service as a career, elective office, or even working on campaigns and, and government. And I think that's a deleterious effect. I think we see it also manifested in terms of the rate of turnout when we talk about safe districts the way it used to be a little bit more equitable. Um, and, um, and therefore, you've got people who are not voting in primaries unless they feel um, they have a, a particular cause that they're going to follow through on, but many people just don't vote in primaries and safe districts, and young people are turned off, others are turned off also. I wonder, guys, it pick up again on, um, on the concept of doing our dollar for dollars at the DNC and the RNC, um, and um, um, that is that they publish, the parties will publish how much money you were able to bring in. And so it's kind of like the shame or praise game. <laughs> and it might be manifested, you know, in little ways, like something you wanted in a bill or something that you were looking for, a committee assignment or whatever. So you also have that that you have to face as a member of Congress. And that's very debilitating in terms of what you can do. Thanks. I want to go towards the back. Yes, uh, with the beard. Right over here. Keep coming. And then pass the microphone over to the gentleman in the open. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, Tom Olson's in there. I'd like to ask a sort of two part question. The first part is very naive. If two thirds of the districts are not competitive, why are people raising all this money? The second part of the question is does anybody look at where all the money gets spent? Uh, it seems to me that. Back in the day, 40, 50 years ago, there was a rule about how much you could spend on uh, election campaigns, and TV time was uh, tightly controlled. Is that where the problem is? Is there such a big industry uh, of uh, getting money from uh, what politicians have to spend or what they do spend uh, that that's where part of the problem is? I'm reminded of somebody talking about the... Uh, you know, the two sides of the coin. I mean, part of the coin is raising money. Part of the coin is who gets the money once you've raised it. So we've got a perfect person to answer that. Steve, uh, maybe you talk about your sure. own election, sure. your leadership uh, pack, mm -hmm. and raising money for the party. You, sure. You've got three buckets that you're two, raising. Two, two responses, Tom. Uh, on the issue of uh, if two-thirds of the districts in, in Congress are non-competitive, why is that money raised? For two reasons. The unintended consequence of redistricting that protects incumbents is this. When I'm on the members-only elevator or in the members' gym, which are the most candid places on uh, the Hill because reporters can... I'm going to ask you about quotes questions. from there later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here's what I hear from, uh, from uh, avowedly Tea Party members. They say to me, i got to raise money because I'm going to catch a primary. For anybody who believes that they don't need money in the bank to defend against a primary in a safe district, I have two words, Eric Cantor. So the, and John Tanner, nobody knows this better than John Tanner, who had a, a bill for national nonpartisan redistricting. And so I don't care where you're from. If you have a district that is competitive in a media market like mine, New York City, $1,500 a point, you've got you to be able to defend yourself against a race. And if you have a safe district, Republican district in Virginia, or a safe Democratic district in New York City, you've got to defend yourself against the potential of a primary. So you're going to raise money. That's number one. Number two, even if you don't have a primary, uh, Connie talked about that list of you know, members who raise money for their colleagues, for the most vulnerable among them, you have an obligation to support the team. 
which means you pay dues to the NRCC or dues to the DCCC, and you have to uh, help contribute to candidates who have real races. And so that's why there's no such thing as a member of Congress who doesn't raise money. There are those obligations. And with respect to where it's spent, I do find it ironic, and I hope I'm not going to uh, agitate uh, anybody from the media here, that the same uh, uh, television and uh, radio pundits who rail against a broken campaign finance system, that their salaries are paid by campaigns who are funding commercials on those stations. I've decided, I'm kidding now for the record, but I've decided that after Congress, here's what I want to do. I want to find a small television station somewhere in Ohio where there is a competitive state house seat and a competitive congressional seat and a competitive statewide attorney general's or governor's seat where I know millions and millions of dollars are going to just flood that, that TV station and ads, keep it for two years, and then flip it. <laughs> it would be a very profitable enterprise. And that's part of the problem. Is that why we have trouble getting attention to this issue, Steve? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I would, I, Tom, just one 30-second add-on to this to, to show the convoluted and insidious nature of the money and its impact on uh, legislators and the negative part of, of this that compounds over and over again. As you move up in your seniority in Congress and you move to higher positions on committees, instead of what we all would intuitively hope in our system is that person becomes an expert in foreign policy on the Intelligence Committee, helping us figure out uh, you know, the complicated issues around the world and traveling to those places to understand it. Agriculture policy. Instead, the very reverse often, often happens where the party goes to those people who are the ranking member and the chairman and says, you have to raise even more money to keep your gavel, to be a chairman, and you're going to do less time protecting our country and understanding how quickly our system is changing and the need to have oversight hearings or travel or learn about uh, the complexity of your job. So the very reverse process is taking place in our legislative system, which is so destructive and, and, and puts it in a downward spiral. Uh, Rick, and then I think we've got a, how many more? Do we have a lot of time? Uh, how much more time do we have? Hed Hedrick Smith. Five minutes. Okay, Rick. Uh, Hedrick Smith. I run a website, Reclaim the American Dream. Tim, that video that you opened with, with Bill Brock and Tom Daschle and Alan Simpson and Connie and yourself, was so impressive. And my question is, and the Reformers Caucus is so important, my question is today, those people, what specific reforms are they prepared to come out as a group and back? Because we need bipartisan backing from public figures like those. You know, disclosure, limits on campaign financing, public funding, uh, rolling back citizens. You know, what are the concrete steps that that group can come together on? So I know the next panel, Rick, is going to be addressing this. Let me give you the 30-second answer and also have Connie give you a 30-second answer on this because I think it is such a profoundly important question. We had a working – we've had several working lunches, teleconference calls, Skypes, everything to try to put together a set of principles on behalf of these 116 former members of Congress – what can we agree to, and how do we put forward these principles to try to get change and reform? We've agreed on a number of them. One, disclosure, immediate disclosure and transparency. Two, uh, Anne was talking about this with Trevor earlier, uh, enforcement procedures and changing the FEC. Uh, three, empowering and encouraging the states as laboratories of democracy to push with referendum and reforms to clean up the state-level politics, which we'll talk about this later, so many states are initiating and succeeding on uh, across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast. And also, uh, fourthly, jurisprudence, that we need to challenge the court on Citizens United and on Buckley versus Vallejo and overturn these decisions, and a president can do that with one or two openings in the Supreme Court, or Congress can trigger that. Uh, so those, the, there are four or five uh, uh, issues right there. I think the fifth one 
Uh, I talked about very briefly in, in the film was um, severing the ties between lobbying and direct contributions to legislators, particularly women in South Carolina. Initially, initially, when I got involved with this, I thought it was like Sisyphus pushing the rock up and it kept coming down. However, we've got to, we've got to continue with moving ahead, and this is showing that it can be done. Tim very nicely articulated some of the high points that you'll come out in the next panel because they've tried to work this so that panels will discuss uh, different things. And, and one of the major things uh, is that people feel turned off. They have no trust in government. This whole concept is to empower people, to let them know they have a role to play, that they can become involved. Maybe referenda in their state. My state has one on for the Montgomery County Council. It has a, a, the governor, who was the first governor elected as a Republican in many years. He took uh, campaign finance money and he won, uh, despite you know uh, an incumbent lieutenant governor. So those are some of the things, but particularly empowering the people and showing them some of the things that have been done as terminations that we could emulate and expand on. Uh, one last question, and then we're going to go to the next panel with a, a short break. Uh, all the way back there in the pink long shirt right on the, uh, on the aisle. Hello, I'm Meredith McGeehee. Um, it's nice to see you soon. Many of you who I've lobbied for many years when you were up on the Hill. I have a political question since this is the political panel. Um, I've lobbied on McCain-Feingold and many previous bills, uh, but it's very tough if you go up on the Hill right now uh, to find anyone on the Republican side to lobby, to even talk to on these issues, which is a change. Uh, when we look at the video and we see a lot of former Republicans talking about this, it's, it's heartening, but it's very disheartening when you try and go up there now. I would like to know your political assessment and reasoning of why the congressional leadership in particular, but the party, the Republican Party in general, has taken as its position such hostility toward any efforts to address the system, have kind of bought into efforts at disclosure or now anti-First Amendment efforts for any kind of uh, campaign finance reform or, or kind of squelching money as speech. As the, pl the politicians who are experts in this area, I, I think it would be interesting to get your assessment of what's happened up there to change that dynamic. Yeah, Tim, you want to take well, Let me just take a brief bit of the history of this. When we first tried uh, limitations, Mitch McConnell always used to say, well, disclosure is all you need. Disclosure is the best antiseptic. And we operated under that for a long time. We were going to agree upon disclosure. But that stopped in 2010 after the disclosure bill died. We thought we had a majority of votes. Many of you were working on that. We thought we had a majority of votes, and the reason that it fell apart was that the National Chamber of Commerce said, we have in our sights enough members of Congress that we think a very significant change can occur in 2010 if we can raise a lot of money, but we can't raise that money if the sources of that money are disclosed. So therefore, the disclosure bill stopped cold in 2010, and there was this explosion of money that came in uh, focused on a lot of incumbents. Now, that, that gets you to a point, now where do these people come from who are just getting elected on that front? Disclosure is something that they don't want to see. Campaign finance reform is something that they don't want to see because they have got that, you know, their self, sur their survival, and their role within the, at this point, the Republican Party, I'm afraid, you know, is, is uh, extraordinarily tied to their traditional. Steve would have a better sense of this than I do. But I think it's a... Uh, I think it's a very dangerous issue. I think we've got to get a lot tougher on this one. I think we play an awful lot of Mr. Nice Guy. And I think the side, much, much of what has to be done on this is a direct challenge to a lot of people and movements around the country. And there are those kinds of movements that are related to poverty, related to climate change, related to women. But people are, for example, and people are saying, is your congressman corrupt? You know, is he on the tape? I think this sort of thing and getting these issues out, you, they're not going to get out because we say campaign finance is going to do it. That's going to—I don't think that gets you anywhere. We've got to—we've got to put a much stronger, a much sharper edge on it. And I think going after you know uh, some very difficult questions is perhaps one effective way of doing it. Steve, last word on this. Very briefly, let me uh, respond to your question with uh, by taking you behind the scenes, 30 seconds. 
Uh, when I became the chairman of the DCCC, I was told that our revenue breakdown was one third from members of Congress, dues to DCCC, one third from political action committees and advocates, and one third from grassroots donations. Towards the end of my cycle at DCCC, one half of all our revenues were coming from grassroots. One half in $3 a day contributions, totaling millions of dollars. And so, I went to, I alluded to this many a times at these confessions of a congressman, I went to one of those fancy Washington black tie dinners where, you know, everybody's eyes lift above your shoulders to see if anybody better is around, and, or, or somebody from the cast of Veep. Uh, and uh, I was talking to a, a Republican leader, a current Republican leader. And he said, congratulations, you've been beating us. The DCCC as a minority party had beaten the NRCC every single month of every single quarter of every single cycle. How is that possible? We're in the minority. He said, congratulations, you're killing us on fundraising because of your grassroots. I said, well, thank you. He said, it doesn't matter. By November, we'll have all the super PAC money. And that's why they don't want to make those changes. So instead of ending our panel on a skeptical or cynical note, I want to encourage you, get your cup of coffee, come back in three or four minutes. The next panel is, going to, is, is called The Time Is Now. We're going to talk about hopeful, practical, common sense, and maybe even bipartisan solutions to get this problem solved. And I think you'll see a panel that believes we can solve it. So can thank I, you. Can again. I ask as well if we say, say something at some point about the revolving door? I think it's a very important element in all of this. Maybe that's sure. Sure, I'm sure it will. Thank you all.